Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Welcome to another episode of Contacts with Advanced Design. Today's special podcast episode uh, continues our conversation with gender inequalities um, from the conversations that happened this past weekend. Um, today's guest is Betsy Barnhart. She is the Program Director of Industrial Design at the University of Kansas. Uh, Betsy is focused on providing a connection between academia institutions and private practice to tackle large scale complex design problems. I'm going to have Betsy, uh, I'm going to say Professor Betsy, um, introduce herself a little bit and tell us a little bit about herself before we get started with this conversation. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor, of course, to be here and just so exciting to have this discussion and this topic be in the spotlight, finally. Um, so my background um, over the past 15 years, I've been professional in industrial design practice, worked in exhibit design. I was a designer at Newell um, doing housewares. Um, I was doing immersive design for a little bit and then I landed in my happy place, which was doing sporting goods design for um, STX and then Nike lacrosse. Um, they're a licensee for STX. So working with soft goods and hard goods and everything else, and then worked my way up there until I was the um, design manager um, at STX. And then I left and went to um, uh, Iowa State um, where I was got my feet wet for three years uh, in the research in the things. I wasn't expecting, and now I'm at KU, um, uh, heading up the ID program here. Uh, which has been pretty exciting. So I didn't expect to be the specialist in um, gender and all of this because it's not my background. Um, I'm not a feminist scholar, but I am someone, I went to fine art for undergrad and the culture was so different going into ID um, to grad school that it was really shocking and surprising. And so since then, I've always just been really aware of issues um, that we've seen. So that ended up just translating into uh, where my research has been for the past five years. That's my my track, my narrative for being <laughs> Absol educator. Absolutely. And I think the reason why we're here today is um, to take a step backwards um, with some of these issues, because we believe that some of these issues can be alleviated, we can start having discussions and discourse on how we can um, really create a better environment in education. And this goes all the way back to high school when we are encouraging our students to enter the field of industrial design. Um, and even in college, um, we can start to have dialogue around, you know, industrial design is not one specific track it's actually if you dissect it there's a lot of kind of moving pieces and um what i've noticed being in academia is that we tend to glorify other parts of industrial design and we tend to you know uh discriminate against students against uh, genders and and those who are you know, m might not be the best sketcher, might not be the best at CAD modeling. And instead of us creating an environment to help them and support them flourish, we instead by one decision can change their trajectory. And that is well, number one, that needs to stop and we need to do something about it. So you and I are both educators. And I think this conversation hopefully is the beginning of change where we can actually start proposing some ideas. Um, a couple of days ago, you started posting work on your Instagram, your students' work, and you started to be very honest on how you started to change your curriculum and the way that you, you, you do in your classroom to kind of open doors for other students and make them feel, um, uh, you know, prepared and, and, and kind of inclusive. And so I would love to get your part of the kind of your story and when did you first start to figure out and start to notice that you needed to change and, and make a couple of changes in your curriculum? And, and then what are some of the things that you started to do? Well, I think 
it actually goes back to when I was um, at STX and uh, we were a small team or a small team, still didn't work with them, but the um, uh, hiring was really difficult because we were looking for a diverse team. We, we had two women, at, we had, we grew to about 13 or 14 that are the largest, but mm -hmm. we we're trying to hire more women and more diversity and we're not getting applicants. It would be like, you know, 500 applications and a handful, like under 10 women. And then the skill sets often weren't there to, and they wouldn't, it was, we didn't have the bandwidth to train up people. Mm -hmm. So right away I saw that there was an issue of just applying, like that wasn't happening. And then an issue of um, inequity in terms of outcomes from education. So I kind of came in to, to Iowa State understanding that. Um, I taught, and I thought, you know, a woman from practice, this will be enough. You know, this is sort of the Band-Aid that everybody throws on there at first. It'll be enough for me to represent and bring in a lot of women. I make sure that I have women and men presenting, try and get as much diversity as I can in front of students um, uh, for, you know, critiques. And then definitely was having a lot of different scenarios where they were seeing what they were up to and everything else. And the outcomes were still um, not the same. And so we're all biased, of course, and I am also biased and I love all my students and I'm like, they're great. Um, so uh, part of my research has been doing assessments for CAD and for drawing. And I was like, we don't have that big of an issue. And if you ask any faculty member, men, male or female, how are your women doing? And this has been universal so far with everybody that I've talked to, they're doing great. The women were really, we're doing great. And I, I kind of felt the same way until we did this, or I did this breakdown and really um, I had them draw a vacuum, all our sophomores through seniors. They had 10 minutes to do it. They could look on the internet. It's enough time where you're really freaked out. Like it's, you're under pressure, but there's, you need to be able, like, it's a good way to tell if they just understand fundamentals of proportion and perspective, line weight, all those things, just to get a, a handle on it. And it was, you had to go down, uh, there were around 90 people who participated. You had to go down 21 on the list to get to the first woman in the, in the mix. It was really like stark and upsetting, to be honest, because I was like, wow, we've really failed this. And similar with CAD. So similar outcomes, which, um, so then I was able to say, we're not okay. And so part of the problem has been, I've been railing about this. I'm not a data expert. So I keep railing about this. And now I'm like the data person. I'm like, okay, but um, the, um, there's no data. So nobody knows a lot of design teams only have like one or two people on them. So if it's only one or two guys, you don't really realize how bad it is out there. Um, and so, no one really understands in education either how bad the problem is because there's been no research done on it. Mm -hmm. Like really, it's so, so different than architecture. We're basically where the 1960s are. So what I did um, after realizing that just having that diversity in the classroom wasn't enough. Over the past five years, I've been working on how, how to change things. And surprisingly, um, so, I taught a soft goods studio. We only had women. We only, I, I didn't make a deal about it, but we only had women guests every week. And we like really made sure that there was a broad range of work. We had CMF people that were there. We had people who were materials experts. We had people more that were on the fashion side. So students were exposed to a broader range and there was equal hierarchy in terms of how they, um, you know, experienced those different areas within ID, which is a problem, but really going through um, and discussing how to go through things and why. So this sounds really obvious, but one of the things that happens in ID and you'll see it in videos is somebody will be like, okay, you're gonna do a hot sketch and you're gonna do it like this. And then now go do it, mileage. It's all about mileage. Or they'll show you how to do it really quickly. It's like, okay, do this. And then you're gonna do this and you're gonna do this. And, and that's how you do it. But, and the students are like, do you understand? And they'll be like, yes, because they don't wanna look like they don't and they walk away. Um, so that I realized happens a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The women were really uncomfortable sketching and doing surveys in the classroom. Um, so what I've done is 
the CAD class specifically was the first time this time, um, it's the fourth time I've taught it where we had equity in the outcomes. And that was because of COVID surprisingly kind mm -hmm. of made me really change everything because it was all online for that class. We didn't meet in person because I was like, I don't know how to get, I, I touch people's mouses mice a lot. I'm like, I don't right. want to do that. Um, and so I ended up having to do a lot of demos and everybody could see. And then when people had a question, I would say, okay, tell me how you're going to work through this. And then when they didn't know, I said, okay, shoot me over your CAD. And I would work through it on the computer and really explain everything. I had someone, a, like a good example was um, they were trying to get their husband to French braid the daughter's hair. And she was like, you just do it like this. And he couldn't do it. And she was like, oh, it's because for me, it's so basic that I just race through all these steps, not understanding that they're not intuitive. Hmm. So I think it sounds so obvious, but there's a lot of things that are happening in our pedagogy that are, and how we teach that are like, you just assume people understand it and mm -hmm. they don't. And then there's not room because um, there's a culture in ID where it's difficult. There isn't that space to say, I don't understand. You wanna, it's competitive. So even with me, students may not say, I really don't understand. They'll just hide. And there was less ability to hide with this. And then they saw me working through it and getting stuck. I think all my demos, there be one moment I was like, just pretend the last five minutes didn't happen and then go back. And then seeing that, that I was working through it and how I worked through it and I'd really talk and communicate, um, that helped. It's, I sound, I feel like I should have like, it should be clearer, but I think mm -hmm. it's really complicated and, and not as easy. And then there's, for drawing, I'm trying to figure it out. There's an engineer, Cheryl Sorby, who's doing some really interesting work on um, gender gaps and spatial recognition. And engineering has done a lot of studies on this and they're able to change how, because women have a harder time with that a little bit, but there's like a 15 hours of um, work that you can do in the classroom. And then everybody's everybody goes up, men and women, but the women end up more equal with the men. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where I'm like, I think I said on Instagram, like it's insulting if you, cause when I'll say we need to change and the initial feedback from people will be, we don't want to dumb down the curriculum. I'm like, that's not what I'm talking about. My mm -hmm. classes are really hard. Mm -hmm. I have like, like for my CAD class, instead of doing one textbook, we did two <laughs> and like we doubled the amount of work. Mm -hmm. And you know, my, I notice everything. I'm a total nerd in CAD and I'd just be like oh that's you know you've got an issue there that's not gonna go away you're not photoshopping that out that would show up in tooling you know like you know not like calling them out but just saying this is still there um so yeah it's I'm still working through all of it but I know that for the drawing I know that we can make changes and I know that we can't just write off the students because that's really what's happening right now to be honest we and we all even how we give feedback to students. Mm -hmm. You'll see if there's women or other people who are really struggling, you'll kind of skip, you'll be like, that's a nice idea, like blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah, and not really get into it. And I feel like that's really just writing them off. Yep. To be honest, like it's not giving them, you know, and then what happens is, so these places, so I've been looking at companies all over the country. And if there's 40 designers, on a team, 30, like 30 to 40 for bigger, bigger design teams, right? On average, it's zero to four designers that are women. It's really bad. Like the, the ratios for hard goods. I'm not talking about UX, UI. Mm -hmm. And then, our, and sometimes it's, you know, there'll be like one soft goods. But for our region, I looked at smaller firms and there's one, you know, for one female designer. And because they, and she's in soft goods. So it's just like, oh, you know, this isn't out of, you know, 70. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I'm sure I missed some, but. I, I think the the students that you're talking about, the students that are overlooked or the students that might be too intimidated to say anything. That was me when I was in school. I was 
I really didn't like Cad and I never spoke up because I was like, I was too concerned about what other people were going to say about me. I was too concerned about the stu this, the professor thinking that I was stupid, too stupid to know um, or to keep up with the, you know, classroom rhythm, et cetera. And um, I would just be like, I'll figure it out later. I'll ask one of my classmates. Um, and a lot of it, and and this started to build as I continue to do this. It was like I I was digging myself deeper and deeper into just more insecurities. Um, so when I went into academia, one thing that I I wanted to to really just reformat is the relationship between an educator and its students because I think it begins there. I think a lot of um, at least this is my experience when I was a student. A lot of my professors. Uh, even on the first day of class, you immediately knew that they were your professor and that for some reason they knew more than you did. And you put, and you immediately put them on this pedestal. Um, and, and it was like that for the whole semester. So you never got to really build a relationship, a professional relationship. I'm not saying like become best friends, but when I started to teach and, and go into education, I became vulnerable. I, I would tell my students, I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers. So if you have a question that I can't answer, I promise you I would go find the answer. Or I will bring someone into the classroom um, and we will work. We would work through things together uh, when I would give assignments. Uh, just like you said, my class, my classes were, were pretty difficult, but I would also do the assignment with the students. Uh, my, I would be in a studio environment. So I would have um, foam core boards. I would fill them up, do the same assignment they did and show them, this is how I'm doing it. This is my expectation. And there, there would always be constant kind of collaboration. And that allowed my students, what I started to notice is to open up and be honest and be, look, I don't understand this. And we would, and um, it is really hard. I, I, you know, you, know, you, you are, a, you know, you're the director of the industrial design program at, at, uh, at KU, um, but it's one of the most fulfilling jobs in the world. Um, when you arrive to that level of trust with your students. And um, I think it really does begin with, with that. It begins with this collaboration. Yeah, and I can speak to that. So I was the same as you. I had a seat in SolidWorks. I hated it, mm -hmm. for real. And I, I, t I say that, I presented at Houston and I say that, you know, like I did not, I was not, a SolidWorks fan. We had Alias and I did what better in that. Um, but I barely made it through SolidWorks and I hated every minute of it. And I've only worked using profession, uh, SolidWorks professionally. And I think I made myself sick before every single job. When, oh no, I did, I did CAD for exhibit stuff. But the, um, it was awful. And so the first thing that I say in SolidWorks is like, okay, so it's like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. I, got a C in SolidWorks. You can't like freak out about it. It's like a, a Zen, you know, experience. And then, and, and I just say like, I always come at it from the um, hardest way possible is my like SolidWorks thing. Like I come, when I go into like, get into SolidWorks, I'll always come up with the hardest way to solve it first. And now mm -hmm. I'm like, that's part of my process. So I just write it down what I'm going to do. And then I walk away and come back and relook at it. And then I'm like, wait a minute, no, I can do it this way. And that, um, and so I have my students do that. And I worked through, that was the big change this year was because it wasn't working because I wasn't in the classroom. The first class period um, was really awful. It was so awful. I think I called my mom afterwards. I was like, this was awful. Um, it was so awful. Um, the students were really unhappy. I was really unhappy because I couldn't see what they were doing um, very easily. And if one person showed their screen, I couldn't see anybody else or talk to anybody else. Mm -hmm. It was really, and usually I was just walking around and I'd just be nosy in the classroom and look at what they're doing. Um, and then I would you know, have them save, work through it and then delete it. Um, and have them redo it, but that didn't work very well. But so what I did this time was what you did. Mm -hmm. And so I would do all their assignments and record it. And there, I swear to God, I would like, I, I have kids, it's their home, it's crazy town. I work, I, you know, I'm doing a lot of things. So I didn't have time to like 
spend five days getting it just right. But I had time to do it a couple of times. And every time I was doing that final demo, something would go wrong. I did not have a single demo where something <laughs> didn't go wrong working through these chapters. But it was actually really helpful for them because then they were like, oh, I'm not an idiot. Like, right. I'm good at SolidWorks, just so everybody knows. I'm, I'm going to say this now because I feel like, <laughs> you know, we don't always say, like, at this point, I know what I'm doing in SolidWorks, but SolidWorks is a total turkey of a program. <laughs> so I would get, you know, I would just get turned around, but it was so such a relief for them to see that I was also working through the same thing. But you're right, it's that trust. And so now I'm like, okay, the big barriers for entry, even if design firms aren't hiring or aren't sketching on the regular, right? There's a lot of places that don't. There's a lot of places right. doing model making or doing stuff in CAD mm -hmm. or using Illustrator. And that's, that's great. And I tell my students that I'm like, I didn't go into ID to be a sketch artist. Mm -hmm. Like I like sketching, but it's not something where I'm like, this is, I love product and I love form and I love functionality and product. And now I'm like SolidWorks is like a puzzle. I'm always, you know, kind of relieved when I get out of the design phase and enter the SolidWorks phase and relieved when I leave the SolidWorks phase. But um, yeah, so, but if these are barriers for entry for jobs, whether they should be or not, which they shouldn't be, we have to have a better way to, and now not, this is a different discussion, but right now they're using sketching to be able to see how people handle form right. and design. So I'm like, all right, so I feel like I've got CAD figured out. I have to, now I have to translate it into mm -hmm. in-person, which I'm like, boy, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to still have demos for them to watch. So I'm still sorting through that. Um, but the outcomes were remarkable for everybody. And it raised the bar. We were able to do more work. We got way more done. We covered way more. I was constantly changing this course the whole semester and just adding my <laughs> poor students. Were, but they did great. Um, but I just kept adding more and more content. And, um, you know, but they, they killed it. And part of it was being able to see somebody else work through it and struggle and know that they're not idiots. And I think that's what happens with sketching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I felt that way with sketching and CAD. I mean, sketching, you know, I can hold my own, but I was never the person where it's like, there's that hot, you know, the hot sketch person. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm really happy that you mentioned that, you know, the key word there is struggle. Students need to see that we are also human and that we're not perfect. And I think um, that allows the student to be comfortable enough to see like, oh my God, they're also struggling and it's not me. I'm not, you know, a weirdo, et cetera. I'm not, um, it, it's, SolidWorks is just a complicated software, right? Um, this happened to me this semester, actually, I was teaching a class, um, a sketching course, and um, and for those who are listening, if you have any questions, please, you know, ask. I'd be more than happy to, you know, integrate into our conversation. But, um, you know, and for those who are listening, I want to let you know that education and teaching is very difficult um, because we all have our shortcuts. We all have our ways of learning a software that make us efficient. But then when you have to teach that to another student, you can't teach it in that format. You have to teach it in a way that it's going to, they're going to understand it, right? Everyone here knows how to use Photoshop, but I bet you everyone here knows how to use it in a hundred different ways, right? So there is no like perfect way of teaching it. So education and teaching is very, very difficult and you have to be really good at it. So I applaud you for, for being in academia. We need more educators that can connect with students. But as I was saying, I was teaching students how to add, um, this is very silly, but I was teaching them how to add drop shadows to spheres. And a lot of this comes second nature to us because we've done it a million times. And when I was teaching it, I had a moment where I just paused and I'm like, oh my God, I think I forgot how to teach this. I know how to do it. Like I could, I started to to tell my students like, hold on, give me a second. And they started to see me get flustered and started to see me like just, you know, kind of freeze for a little bit. Um, because I was like, how do you, how do you do this? And how do you, you know, get the angle of light, et, et cetera. And, it, you know, it's for us, it's like, 
breathing oxygen and sometimes you you forget stuff and sometimes so i had to go back and and the students started to talk and start to say well maybe you do it this way and they started to suggest and we walked we kind of started talking through it and that allowed me to really be like okay actually you guys are right and this is how we do it and it was a really nice thing that happened and um i'm happy that it happened and it, it wasn't the first time that that has happened to me um where i get like just a brain fart and i'm just like oh man i should know this like i know this like right now if you pay me i'll show you i'll prove it like um but you know uh, and students i think that that's important for students to see is that educators need to be humanized we're not robots we're not you know and yeah we're really busy and sometimes you don't interact with them a lot so you 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 build this wall of intimidation and we need to break those walls down because students need to they're investing in their education and they should feel free to come to talk to us about anything well and i think for all the the instructors out there i think it's kind of it can be intimidating and scary to teach and you don't on that end too like you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing you know or that you forget like you know <laughs> basic stuff i mean i was there were I, my students, I was like, I was like, please, if you ever share any of these online, I will never talk. To you. <laughs> I, like, yeah. I can only imagine, uh -huh. you know, that would come out of that on the dark internet um, side of the world. <laughs> and I think that's a big part of it. So we had Spencer Nugent, who of course is amazing. We all love him. Um, he came and did, a, well, came on Zoom and did a three-part workshop for our students. And the best part of it that students loved the most was he got hung up and confused on something for a reflection. Mm. And it was so great because you saw him working through it and not be able to figure it out. But he was he was doing something that you is a learned skill, which is mm -hmm. talking through every single thing you're doing and why, and not just thinking of it and panicking, but like walking through where you got caught up, why you're confused, what you're trying to do, why you're doing what you're doing. He's amazing at, at that. Um, and compared to being like, oh, that's not right, do this. Right. Cause then it's like, oh, okay. I have no what, the idea what you did or why, but I'm, I'm gonna agree with you. Cause yeah, it's like, if somebody asks you, do you know this famous designer and you don't, you're like, yes, you know? And you're like, no, I don't, I don't know them. <laughs> but you don't wanna look like an idiot. And I think faculty have the same you know, I get super nervous doing demos. I, mm -hmm. I hate it, um, but I do it because I just, you know, I don't hate it, but I do get a little bit of stage fright too. Mm -hmm. And I just, now I'm like, I just tell my students that because they know they get the same thing, obviously. And it does, it just humanizes you a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, our whole industry, what we do as we continue to design products is figuring out and walking through it, talking through it. So, um, yeah, I, I would love to shift the conversation into the glorification of some things in our in our industry in education. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not here to say that some things are, are are better than others, but I am here to state that we definitely promote other parts of design and and we totally um, just discriminate you know, with, with other parts of, of design and design, industrial design has so many moving pieces, but we love to, even on social media, we love to pump those renderings out. We love to see all these wonderful sketches and um, prototypes, these pretty prototypes, which is an oxymoron because prototypes shouldn't be pretty, right? And um, and then we, we totally like this on other parts of industrial design or, or we don't talk about them and we don't talk about how important they are. Um, and it's really funny because some of the most successful companies in the world need these parts, need, need, you know, these, these other parts that we don't glorify, um, in order to, for them to come out with successful products. Um, and we need to change that, that conversation in the design education. And, uh, I'm talking about like design research and, you know, color material finishes, even design for manufacturing, right? Like that sounds so as i'm saying it it sounds so lecture and so blah right but think about it our whole industry is manufacturing so we need to make things exciting you know 
um, I was telling you earlier that I, I've been in meetings with chairs and senior faculty where we we would have to tell students that they don't they're not going to make an industrial design and that they should decide to go into design research because they'll 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 be better there. Um, I, I spoke up a couple of times and and then after that I had the had this fear of of retaliation or, or of I felt like I got discredited, you know, like, you know, um, and it's very, it's, it's, it's awful. And I don't know what to do. Um, and I hope that someone like you who was in your position that, um, I don't know, let's talk about it. There's, what are some things that we can do to start changing that perspective? Um, because all of these pieces are amazing and no one is better than the other. I think having, so we've been in our department speaking really honestly about that. And so like in our, in our, we have a department where we're more on the practitioner side, everybody is in practice um, or makers, you know, it's not on the research side as much. And for me, um, having that's where the Iowa State experience was a really great one because I got my feet wet with people who were doing a lot of, you know, more of that research and writing and the um, UX UI and, and all of that. Um, so it was a nice way to see how that was going. And then they struggled more with the, you know, some of the, the tangible side of the hot, the hot sketch stuff maybe mm -hmm. i mean they had students that were doing well with that as well but and then we were struggling more with the ux ui you know sort of thing we're doing better with that but it's through just really honest conversations and just it was really nice so all of our faculty communicate with our students early on saying you know our you know our, it was great in our junior studio the professor he was like so you guys are all fixated because they are on sketching and rendering and cad rendering but that's robots are going to be taking that over in the next few years. Like we've got maybe, maybe four more years of that before that's like, you're basically working as an illustrator at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so your thinking and your ability to problem solve is really what's valuable. Um, these are, you know, not, but it is a barrier to entry to not be able to sketch. It's something that people get really hung up on. Um, so I think that's something that's, like faculty can get hung up on it. Like if they're not super great at sketching or whatever, they can get sort of, I've seen that at a couple places where people, then they can kind of glorify it a little bit too. But I think, you know, in our classrooms, we, when students start the first day of their senior years when they're all panicking, right? I just say to them, cause I teach a senior studio, it's okay to not want to do product design right now. And this is a huge field. And my job is for you to find what you love and then I've been making a point of having CMF people since I was at Iowa State come and present and show what they do. And it's really cool. Integrate them into the studio research, understanding that like we work with Black and Decker and they talked about the importance of research and that if it doesn't meet, if you don't understand research, if you don't do research and you don't understand how all that really works and do it in a deep, meaningful way, then if it looks good, like who cares? Like your job isn't your job is to make product that is meeting the needs of people. And you can't do that if you just can sketch. And if you don't understand, and that's why in the CAD class, they always had to have draft. They always had to have correct thickness. It had to be, I mean, cause for the work that I do for SDX, we own it all the way up to manufacturing. So everything has to be perfect. And if I put something on that, you know, CAD file, it's gonna get manufactured. And so understanding how that all works is so important. It's like what you're saying, like with cost, like understanding, you know, how things like cost out. So I think it's the instructors have to respect it. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, it's, I feel like everything just sounds so basic um, from what I'm saying, like, it's so kind of obvious, but I think that the glorification of sketching and now hot key shot renderings is so real and such a problem and so limiting and, and, it is a true barrier for entry into the field. Mm -hmm. It can be for hard goods, right? Mm -hmm. I had students, 
So for my soft goods studio, they all have to do real tech packs. I do soft goods design, I can do a killer tech pack. So I'm like mm-hmm. super nerdy about it. They like do it all like, so it can be manufactured, cost, understand materials, understand how things are constructed. It's the CAD of right. soft goods, right? And um, I've had so many hard goods people tell all my students to get their tech packs out of their portfolios. And I'm like, no, you know, like this is, I, I, that is more interesting to me than your, after, after a certain point, I know you can draw and, and that's important. And I also want to see that you can do research, that you understand the needs of the user. You're not doing the squircle, squircle, whatever for everything, you know, right. like not everything is pastel, mm-hmm. that pinky color right now and gray, like that you, you know, not, not, I love squircles, mm-hmm. squircles. Not everything is a pill. Not everything is a pill. Yeah. So I think, I think that owning it, talking about it, bringing in people to reflect on that in a, a real way, bringing in experts, you know, a designer from Nike, CMF designer, you know, and she was doing way more interesting work than the designers were because she was the one making sure it was all going to function, mm-hmm. the materials were going to look right. And like, how do you make it so that a fiber doesn't break down, you know, in the middle of a game? Like it was, I don't know, it was for me, like really interesting. So I think valuing it as an instructor is important. Someone brought up um, grading in education. And when I first started teaching, I used to grade on the skill, like, oh my God, this student is like an amazing sketcher. And he would do maybe two assignments out of the 10. Boom, A, because he's like an amazing sketcher, right? It was awful. I also just heads up, I was trying to figure this out, right? Um, But now the way that I teach six, seven years later, I teach on progression from where you begin to the end of the semester. I need to see growth. I don't care if you start as the best sketcher and you are the best sketcher at the end of the, at the end of the best CAD render or prototype or whatever the case may be. I need to see progression and growth. If you're the best in the beginning, you are going to, I'm going to give you a really tough grade because you need to be better than what you were when you, you began. Right. And um, so I grade on progression. Um, and uh, I've been pretty fortunate enough where I've taught is that the classes are smaller. So there are about 12 students to 14 students. So you have a really good intimate, you know, experience with students and you're able to really manage uh, kind of this one-on-one growth. Um, and I'm wondering how, how do you kind of approach grading? Because it is, it can be pretty subjective, especially what, what depending on what you're teaching. It can be really subjective. I hate grading personally because of that. Um, so I kind of handle it different ways. The CAD class, um, I hope no one from K is watching. I haven't graded, <laughs> gotten grades. They got a lot of feedback is mm-hmm. what they got. And just like, you know, work on this, work on this. They had to present all of their work and they had like really solid feedback and they're getting graded on their growth. Grades are due by midnight or the projects they have to submit them by five. They haven't. Um, but and then, uh, but um, yeah. So grading is is kind of like the big nightmare. Um, so yeah, it's super subjective. Um, and I think I've talked to enough people where everyone knows those students that are like hot stuff sophomore year, freshman year, and then the senior year, other students are destroying them and their skill sets. Mm-hmm. Or people like I'll tell my students constantly. You might be awesome right now as seniors. You better be nice to everybody because people are going to grow after college. That's one thing that everyone now, I think it's Behance. I'm blaming the world on all problems on Behance. But everybody thinks that your skills are done your senior year. But 10 years ago, you know, people didn't feel like that as much. I feel like, you know, it was more like they're going to grow and you see potential. It wasn't final like professional loving level work but now expectations are sort of this professional level work so for cad it was a lot of feedback and then they'll be graded on growth like it'll be it'll be on that and getting the work done and i just want to see and i would tell them this too i was like i just want to see that you understand what is happening like just 
And so they had room then to fail a little bit. And sophomore studio, the first project, I graded them really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, and so, uh, yeah, so I graded them. I was like, so I'm treating you like your professional level and I'm gonna grade you like if you were working for me in a job and like at that level compared to like, and this is where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the semester, it was all based exactly like what you're saying on how much they increased their skill sets and how, how they worked through things. And I think that is, and I told them that I was like, this is where you're at right now. And then your final grade would be on where you're at right then and just do the work and show up. And for seniors, it's a whole lot of talking. We have, we were really fortunate as well in that our whole program, you know, maxes out at 20 students total um, per year. So we know all our students. Um, we have a lot of students who are internships or study abroad. So it usually ends up being around, you know, 12 to 16 students in the class at a time. Um, so we have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so I'm able to, you know, it's more talking and just like, yeah. this is what you need you know, for portfolio, you're going to need to do this. You should develop this skill and less on grades and more. Cause for me, and I just tell them this is like, who cares about a grade? Like your portfolio is all that matters. So I'm not, I'm not the best grader, <laughs> but I'm a good talker. Yeah. That's totally okay. They know where um, we have a couple of questions that are coming in and I'm going to start to kind of bring them up. Uh, this question is asked by Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Thank you so much for asking this question. Um, he wants to know, how do you think you would change the studio interactions with that in mind as we move back to face, as we move back to face to face classes, uh, what he's noticed at uh, ISU as well online is that women in his classes seem to feel more comfortable. So how do you bring that level of comfort back to face to face classes beyond working alongside of the students to show Vulnerability, uh, vulnerability. That's a really good question. Hey, Dan. Um, uh, the um, I know I know who this Dan is. Um, yeah. So that's something that I've been trying to figure out too. Mm -hmm. Is um, like, what do you do? And I think it's, I think it's breaking it down because for my senior studio, and and really checking in for one of the class periods, like if you have two or three a week where it's just one-on-one -on -one with each student and talking to them and asking like, if there's something that you really wanna work on, like, what is it? What's one thing that you're uncomfortable with? And then that seems to help. And then I'll say like, you know, like I have to draw a lot of really long, sweeping, perfectly <laughs> offset lines when I sketch and it's like, you know, uh, sort of a nightmare sometimes. Um, and uh, so I always say like, that's something that I have to work on. And so I'll just say, you know, is there something that you want to improve on that we can talk about? And then that seems to help. But I think breaking, having it set so it's not all the group, that there's more individual, I think is the trick. And then keeping track and comments for the group of who's talking. Because there are usually, you know, there's like four or five they'll take over the class. And there can be women, you know, that are doing that too, but there's definitely women who will hide back. Yep. This one here is a very good question. And this is asked by Becca. And uh, she says that she loves the conversation around educating instructors to understand importance of alternative paths throughout design. Equally difficult to shifting the academic approach to these skill sets would be the professional reset that requires the inclusion of these specialties into the industry. As you mentioned, the sketch and render space can become a barrier of entry. How do you reset professional expectations to look beyond the flashy aesthetic to see potential and opportunity in the thought process, research, production value? I think that the conversation, just having this conversation is going to be really important. Just getting the, so people don't know that there's so few women in industry, Like people will think that they're the outlier if they only have four women and there's 40 people. I'm like, you're not, that's the norm. So um, for product, um, I think if they want to have a more diverse, if they're honest and if they really mean it, that they want to have more diversity, in terms of gender and race, 
then they're going to have to look outside of what they think is like the norm. They're gonna need to value, I think it's having these conversations saying you'll make more money. And this is something you know that I say all the time, you'll make more money if you have people who aren't just like you, who, you know, like, and I said on there, like everybody goes to on the, the whiskey, the like every, like IDSA, we're talking about this, like this is across the country, you know, the weekly whiskey night is the thing. I don't, I, I like to, I like to go to that like every couple of months, but not every week. And there, I've talked to a lot of women who have said that's a barrier because I don't want to go or other people who don't want to drink maybe or something, but right. they don't get raises and they don't get, there has to be a broader range of personality types and value in that and what people want to do and who they want to be with. It shouldn't be. And that means hiring people who have different skill sets than you do. It's, it sounds like a roundabout answer, but it's really having that conversation. Like if you want to have more diversity, then mm-hmm. you're going to need to hire people with different types of portfolios and different skill sets and different points of view and what they value. And it doesn't mean that they aren't going to kill it doing design work because they will. They'll bring a different perspective. I think, and that's a very good answer. And I think this is this is why I um, I think educators or designers who go into education to teach design, to, I think they really need to be um, a champion for every aspect of design and they have to speak things into existence. So you have to be really good at a lot of this stuff too. You can't come into education with an angle and, oh, I'm just like really good at rendering. And then you just milk that. Or you can't come into education and say, I'm the sketcher guy. And you just milk that. That's going to get you not very far. And um, it's also going to give you a very, very, um, you know, um, small perspective um, because then you're not going to go beyond that. Your students won't be able to rely on you. Um, industrial design is a global kind of industry. You need to have that global perspective and be good at everything. Um, so when people have asked me, should I go to graduate school to go and go into academia? I ask them all these really hard questions like are you passionate about other things that than just what what your uh, forte is right you need to be good at other things um because students are going to rely on you and you need to bring that expertise in all in other areas of design education um if you're only good at sketching or rendering or whatever then you're going to gravitate and students are going to gravitate only to you because of that and you're going to start creating division. And one thing that I've noticed in education, this is my experience, is I've seen some educators who get around students um, who are already really good, right? And and the students that need help are left behind and the, and the, the educator kind of removes himself from that student. And I'm always questioning from afar, I'm like, you're helping the students that don't need help and you should be helping that student right there or else why did you go into education, right? And and that I've, I've seen that many times and it's crushing. It's like when you are in review and you kind of gloss over the people who are struggling. And I've, I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie, like this is something I've seen myself too. Cause it's like, what do you do if that person isn't just understanding form. And you're like, do you just write them off and say, this person just doesn't get form? I'm like, no, because my undergrad was, you know, ceramics and everything else. And they were really good at teaching form. Like they were really, really good at that. And it wasn't through sketching, you know, and it's just like, okay, so we can, and that's where I'm like, there's probably a better approach. I don't know what that answer is yet. I'm working on it um, to getting that form that understanding of form and how do we show that than what we're doing right now, which is relying so heavily on sketching and not valuing any other. And I think there's a lot of professors that have a chip on their shoulder, you know, and a lot of designers that have a chip on their shoulder. Um, it's, it's a hard field because you have to know so many things and no one's gonna be an expert at everything. Right. And so to be able to own that and just say, 
you know, like I suck at key shot because I've never had to do it professionally. And so I'll bring in people that are really awesome at key shot and I'll take notes and I'm doing it too, you know? And like when Spencer was, I was at all of those workshops and I was drawing along, you know, with them cause it's fun. Um, but, and I love that kind of stuff, but I think that's a big part of it is just not giving up on people and not writing them off and seeing the value. Like, and if, and I've seen also where, and if women, I've seen it with women where if they have a really good eye for graphic design, if their core skill sets are strong, they're automatically told by people in, in reviews, you're going to go into CMF. And they'll be like, I don't want to go into CMF. I want to go into this. And they're like, no, you're going to go into CMF. And it's just like, okay, so why not give them the choice? Why not say there's a really great field that you might really enjoy called CMF <laughs> instead of it's sort of this write-off prescription is how it comes off or how students perceive it. So I think, you know, and there is a really great field called CMF and people do really great in it. And it's, you know, pretty awesome, you know, line of work. And, um, so I think um, we can make a big difference. I think that's the other thing is professors don't realize how big of an impact they have on students and little things that they say will stick forever. Mm -hmm. And you're so you're in such a power um, position and you have so much authority and you can change the direction of someone's life by your flippant comments. And yeah. I'm always aware of that. Um, I think that's really important to think about. Yep, I can attest to that. I, I, I have some things buried in in me from my professors from school, and I'm just like, can't believe you said that. Yeah. Um. But um. For those who are listening, whether you're a designer or you're in education. Where do we go from here? How can we start? I know you said this conversation is the beginning. Um, you know, this past weekend, a lot of things happened and I'm happy that they did. And 2020, we've just been putting band-aids on everything. And I know we're going into the holidays, but I, I wanna continue these conversations. I swear I will have these conversations on Christmas. I don't care. I think we need to not let go of the gas. We need to put more pressure and we need to continue to talk because if we don't, this is gonna go away in a couple of weeks and we're gonna forget it. and here comes another Band-Aid, we'll bury it under the rug. But if we need to, if we really need to make change and impact, I think we need to continue talking about this and invite other people, invite people from all walks of life and, and perspectives to, to continue educating everyone. What are some other things that we can do for those who are educators. And if you're listening in, what are some small changes that they can do as they start to work on their curriculum to go back for spring of 2021? So it's so, this is so easy, this one, uh, because we're all Zoom or not, we're not all Zoom, a lot of people are Zoom, but people, a lot of professionals are working from home and have more free time, or not free time, but they have more flexibility in their schedule um, to bring in professionals from broader backgrounds and to bring in people who aren't, you know, bring in your white males, they're awesome. And bring in your not white males, like try and get just a better spread of like who it is that you're talking about and like that you're having present their work, have them talk about what, ask them what's something that you really struggled with, you know, in school. That's something that we don't really ask visiting uh, designers very often, mm -hmm. it's really important. And by having people from other areas, like I had a product manager, you know, talk about their work. And I had somebody talk about, you know, managing um, material or manufacturing um, overseas, like that's their job, but it's so important because they're, you know, that's how your product is getting made. And if you don't understand how that works, then your product is just an illustration and whatever, you know? So you have to understand that. So I think that's the first thing would be to, to just, it's so easy. It's so easy. Just go on LinkedIn, scroll through and people will always say yes. And you always know somebody, this community is so small. The other thing is be careful right now. Um, I had a several, I've had a lot of women reach out to me um, this week, a lot um, saying they're afraid to like 
comments for what everything is going on, that their company is taking this personally, that they're not, you know, you know, I, I think everybody needs to stop saying this is a really small industry because it makes people who are in the minority mm -hmm. feel even more afraid of it. It doesn't, it's not, that's been very clear this week is that it's, it's really intimidating. If that's an intimidating thing to say, it's like everyone's watching you and everyone will know if you, whatever. So I think that is something that we need to kind of stop and step back from a little bit. Because that's something that's said often. It is a small community, it's not that small. You know, I'm like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. So just giving people a little bit of room. And then um, for the classroom, having this conversation and like I always assign, you know, invisible women, there's a podcast because the students don't have to read if they don't, you know, because I never know if they're going to read stuff. Um, but they can listen to that while they're doing CAD or they're doing their sketches or whatever. Um, but 99 cent or percent invisible has the invisible women podcast. And that's a great one to start the conversation around all of this for all students. And then just really talking about diversity and design and having these conversations for everyone and not just within the women in ID community. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is to start a women in ID group at your school um, because we don't have a national women in ID. We're a very strange field with that. There's no, there's no community. There's now five years ago, there's nothing. And now there's Chicago and San Francisco and those, they're all fantastic. And so if we can get all the schools to get a group together, we can create a larger community. And this goes to all educators. These are really good steps to start implementing now. These are nothing crazy that you can't do. These are all very achievable. So I really appreciate your suggestions. I think we need to change a lot of things um, because this, this is gonna benefit so many students at the end of the day. And that's what matters. That's why we went into education. Um, for the students, right? For for the growth, um, and and even as we're talking about design education, I'm also thinking about like even the way that we critique, right? Our students in critiques, those can become a very hostile or toxic environments um, because there's a kind of reputation to critiques that it's like the end, you know, and everyone should be intimidated. And, you know, here's a very good question here, and we can wrap this up with this question. Um, you know, how do you critique a student when everyone is, every student is mentally different? How do you, I don't even know if the word critique is the correct word that we should be using, right? Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. What is the best way to kind of Go about doing that that's a great question um so we actually had so it's um we had a review and i invited men and women everyone you know to attend for our seniors um and it was it was more male because the industry is more male and they gave great feedback um but then i was like why don't we do an all women's panel for our women in design group and it's only women in the field and I have recordings from all of them. And so I'm just going through and mapping out language and how questions are asked. Um, and it was a very different experience. So what was interesting is that the, and I did it too in the group that had a mixed, um, you know, males and females, males and women, men and women, um, <laughs> um, where it'd be like, did you think about this? Have you tried this? Did you do this? And I was doing it. I'm not, this isn't me. Like, I'm not like anti guy. People think now that I'm like anti white guys. I'm like, that's not true. Um, I like everybody. I just want our women to do okay too. But the, um, <laughs> my best friends are whatever. But so the, um, uh, anyway, so it was really like, have you thought about this? Did you do this? This isn't really working. Did you think about that? So, and it was all, you know, feedback where I was thinking the same stuff. Yeah, I was kind mm -hmm. of going there too. And then with the all women panelists or reviewers, 
Um, it was our sophomores through seniors that were presenting whatever, they had two projects they could show and it was just getting feedback. And the feedback was so different. It was like, oh, what an interesting idea. Like we should do this and, and you could do this. And what about this? And like, did you think about doing something like, you know, like you could, you could do something like this, but it was much more like um, open and, and kind of excited and about the potential instead of ask like, cause if you're always asking, did you think about this or what about this? Da, 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 it's like, no, I didn't, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And that made a really big difference. So that's something I'm actually going through right now. Just being like, that's another paper is, is like just how that communication style changes the effect in the, the women at the end of that review felt much more hopeful and much more, they saw a future <laughs> for themselves compared to the others. I'm sure it's the same for the, the men as well. So I'm still conducting interviews from that because that just happened this past week, but it was really interesting um, and it was insightful. So I think just our, yeah. What are you trying, I think before you start a review, just saying, we're trying to see what could happen, mm -hmm. not just say what you should have done. Right. Yeah, I know. I know. During my critiques, we spend a lot of time providing feedback to the students that need it, and for the students who are excelling, I tend to not spend a lot of time on their work. Um, and I think that is important because, like you said in the beginning, you can easily just be like, "This is nice," and kind of, you know, move forward to the next student. Um. But let's wrap up the conversation. Uh, here is one final question. And uh, this is from Becca. And her question is, can we also get the name of the engineer slash study mentioned earlier in the conversation around spatial skills? Yep, Cheryl Sorby is the name of the engineer. And if you Google gender gaps and spatial recognition, You'll find, you'll find it. But I don't have the name of the paper off the cuff. But that should, that'll get you there. It's, it's really interesting. Um, awesome. Um, well, Professor, thank you so much for coming on to Context. Um, like I said, this is the beginning of more conversations to come. And for those who tuned in, thank you so much for your time. And uh, hopefully, hopefully this allowed us to end 2020 on a high note. I think these conversations are good. Um, I think this is just the beginning of a lot of work. And one thing that I noticed and why I reached out to you immediately when you started to share some of these stories on your Instagram is because you were the only educator that was saying something and I was like, everyone else is speaking up. Where is all the educators at? You know, these are the people that are responsible and have influence over the next generation of designers. They are decision makers, they're stakeholders. Where are they? Um, I started texting some of my friends who are educators, some of the people that I look up to and, and I'm like, you should say something you should you know, you're the chair of this program, you are at X, Y, and Z, and I don't know, um, but it's very important because we, we're failing some students, and I'm not saying we're giving them an F, but I, I'm saying a lot of them are not, they don't trust us, and, and that needs to change because we need to really level this playing field for not only our students, um, but those who are already at a disadvantage, but also for the other amazing disciplines in industrial design, they deserve the same attention as some of these amplified disciplines. So any final remarks? Um, no, I'm just so, like I was horrified by the comment feed on that Yanko design post, but also really relieved that they didn't delete it or block it. And I put that on there. Um, and I think that it just, we're the only field, you know, STEM field, design field that has had no conversation about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been, in the past five years, things have been going, like things have been happening. Um, but 
oh my gosh, you know, for that to start in 2015 is appalling um, and somewhat shameful. And we can, you know, we can make a difference through doing very simple, small things. And the first thing is recognizing that it's a problem. And I think that we're not recognizing a problem because it's hard to see it if everybody is doing well at your workspace. And it's hard to see it if you only have like three designers on your team, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to see it if you're not getting, you know, the applicants. Um, but it's a problem and it's something that we can do something about if we don't blame the people who are struggling, which we do by saying it's about mileage, it's about mileage. It's like, well, then you're teaching. And I've, I've said that to students and I'm like, wait, that, that just means I'm failing. And I've done enough interviews now with students where they're like, okay, mileage, but why? Nothing changes with this mileage. And, and that's really insightful. And so we have to stop saying it's about mileage and saying, what are we doing that we can do? What are we, why is this pedagogy from the past 40, mm -hmm. you know, 50 years not working for this group of students and take responsibility for that? So I'm just excited that it's on the table at a national level finally, um, at this degree of the outreach hasn't been there overall. Like there's been women groups that have been working, but not everyone, it's not. Mm -hmm. So I think this is uh, really important and I'm really hopeful and optimistic that things are gonna change. And I know the design teams that need more diversity, they're aware of that. And I know that they'll be reaching out to you know, see what they can do because they can do things. It's just, it is hard. It's all really complicated, but we can do it one step at a time. Yep. And uh, I can tell you that advanced design will put you know, resources and will invest in making sure that this is not a band-aid um, and that we continue the conversation because um, that's our job as educators. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Betsy. We really appreciate your time and your insights. For those who are listening, thank you for tuning in, for asking your questions. And uh, please, continue talking about this because if you stop, then, you know, um, then it just goes away and I, I don't want that to happen. So we need your help and uh, please reach out to both Professor Betsy or to uh, Advanced Design and we'd be more than happy to continue this conversation. So thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, it's been, it's been an honor to be here. Thank you. As always, goodbye Betsy. Bye. Bye everyone.